In this video, I'm going to talk about whether $10,000 per Ether is actually still possible in 2021, because this is one of the most common price predictions floating around there on the internet, and a lot of people are scratching their heads saying, I don't know, like... ETH has been really moving slow lately. The price hasn't gone up that much. Can we actually still see $10,000 per Ether here in 2021? So I know a lot of you are thinking this, and that's why I want to make this video as a blockchain developer who works the Ethereum protocol on a daily basis and an Ethereum investor myself. So before we get into that, you know, if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to become a blockchain master step-by-step -step from start to finish, then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. And last but not least, I hate these disclaimers. This is not financial advice. I'm not telling you to buy or sell ETH based on this information. And there are tons of people impersonating me down in the comment section below. They're all scammers. Don't even pay attention to them. I'll never give you my phone number or ask you to invest with me. All right, so let's see if $10,000 per ether is still possible for this market cycle this year. And, you know, as always, full disclosure, I don't personally know what the price of ETH is going to be, you know, six months to a year from now. I don't think anybody really does. I'm not going to show you a bunch of charts because I'm not really a trader. I'm not a TA guy. You know, I'm personally a developer, but I am invested in this for the long term. And I like to really look at the big picture and think critically about where this can head long term. And so I want to share some of that, you know, insight with you right now through a, a really specific analysis. So as always, this analysis about what's truly possible is going to be based off of a set of assumptions. And I'll try to clearly outline those assumptions assumptions so we can like reason from first principles and try to come up with a range of possibilities. Now, these assumptions will differ from other people because there are multiple schools of thought on how this cryptocurrency market works, what the nature of reality here is. There are some people who will say that this time is different, that we're not going to see these boom and bust cycles of the cryptocurrency markets like we saw in 2017 and previous cycles. But there are other people who say that's absolutely crazy, that this cycle is playing out a lot like the last one, that human nature doesn't change that much. And there's no good data to say that we're going to deviate from, you know, how how things worked the last time. So let's go with that. That will be our first assumption that we are in a boom and bust cycle a lot like the previous cycles, okay? I think that's a safer assumption even if it ends up being wrong in the long term because one, history is much more likely to repeat itself than not. And number two, the downside risk of that being wrong is way less. Like if it truly is, you know, up only, then it's probably better to underestimate that and assume the price is going to go down at some point for an extended period of time rather than just banking on it going to infinity forever. All right, so assuming that we are in a market cycle, let's also just assume that this cycle will continue and that some, you know, big event doesn't happen that completely ends the party early because that could happen, but let's just assume it won't. And that, you know, demand for cryptocurrency uh, continues to increase, which is probably the thing that's going to cause this cycle to continue. So these will be our core assumptions. So let's look at this last one right here and see how much demand actually has to continue to flow into the space to make ETH reach $10,000 per coin and whether that's possible. All right, so now let's quantify this demand. So how much money has to flow into the space? So if ETH is going to reach $10,000 per coin, it roughly has to 5x from where we are right here, okay? So there's going to be a little bit of a delay by the time this video gets published, so this price might be different by the time you see it. But uh, ETH essentially has to reach $1.1 trillion in market cap, okay, in order for the price to reach $10,000. Because don't forget, market cap is what drives the overall cryptocurrency price. Bitcoin has a market cap of about, you know, $1 trillion. So essentially, ETH has to reach Bitcoin's current market cap just a little bit higher in order to reach that price of $10,000. You know, you can see the total cryptocurrency market cap is about $1.7 trillion. And ETH alone has to accrue, you know, a little over $800 billion just to into this asset alone. So a few things need to happen. You know, the entire crypto market cap is going to have to go up significantly, probably in order for ETH to reach that level. You know, we're going to see market cap go into, we're going to see money go into lots of other cryptocurrencies before ETH reaches that price level. We're going to see a lot of it go into Bitcoin. We're going to see it to go into ETH. We're going to see it to go into some of ETH's competitors. So the total crypto market has to go up quite a bit. But let's look at some things that would cause funds to, you know, flow directly into Ethereum itself. So what are some factors that could cause, you know, $800 billion of the market cap to flow into Ether compared to other investments? Well, I want to look at two big factors here. The first is narratives and the second is fundamentals because the cryptocurrency markets largely rely upon narratives to direct price action. But fundamentals are also another big factor. You know, crypto needs narratives in order to take off, but fundamentals are ultimately what gives it legs and causes, you know, the narratives to actually have staying power for the assets themselves. And if we have enough power in either one of these categories, you know, enough narratives and enough fundamentals, then all these factors could work together 
together to give Ethereum the momentum that it needs to cross that $10,000 finish line. So let's look and see how that works. So the first narrative I want to talk about is ETH as a store of value, because that's one thing that it kind of has going against it right now. People talk about Bitcoin being a good store of value and ETH not because it has an infinite supply, it's inflationary, all that kind of stuff. So the first thing is that ETH does have an infinite supply, but it has a fixed issuance schedule. And over time, that trends towards zero. And there's lots of things on Ethereum's roadmap coming up that could change the dynamics of this, like EIP 1559 coming out in July. That will burn ETH when new transactions are created and potentially make Ethereum deflationary long term, which would totally flip this narrative on its head and make the argument that, you know, ETH actually is a good store of value in terms of its monetary policy, but also just what you can do with it. You can stake it and actually earn interest on it natively on the network itself, like while you're holding it. So narrative number two is that ETH can't scale. So part of this is also flipping this narrative back on its head in the opposite direction that ETH can scale because that's going to be really important for Ethereum to become, you know, worth more than it is today. So the good news is we have some short term solutions for this coming out really soon. Layer two scaling solutions. I've been talking about this a lot on my channel. So those are just around the corner, which will also really help with ETH gas fees. That's one of the most common complaints is that Ethereum is too expensive to use. But that problem is going to get a lot better really soon. We've also got EIP 1559 coming out in July, which will help with the gas fees and also ETH 2.0, you know, long term. So all these things are really going to change this narrative. And, you know, if ETH really is going to become a world computer smart contract platform for decentralized applications, the future of the internet and finance, digital art, all that kind of stuff, you know, it needs to scale. So it's the leading horse in that race right now. And we've got a lot of big changes coming up down the road that'll help it maintain that lead. So the other big narratives that I want to talk about, and I'll go through these a lot faster because I have a lot more points I want to make, are really about, you know, the use cases for ETH. So DeFi number one, in the future of finance, this one's really powerful because it could attract a lot of money into the space. You know, whether DeFi becomes a replacement of the existing financial infrastructure an alternative to it. That remains to be seen. But an overwhelming majority of the DeFi activity is happening on top of Ethereum right now. And I expect that can continue, especially as the scaling issue improves. Also, the narrative of ETH for NFTs. The NFT trend is taking off like a rocket. Sure, it's probably in a bubble, but the Google trends for NFTs are taking off like a rocket. They're even bigger than the search term for Ethereum right now. So even if they are in a bubble, I still think they have a lot of long-term potential to attract people who aren't interested in finance, you know, outside the crypto space into this arena. And if ETH has a narrative going forward that it's used for NFTs. And if NFTs become a really big use case, that's also a really strong narrative for Ethereum. And the last narrative is one that I don't see a lot of people talking about, which is, you know, ETH being the green blockchain. This would be compared to Bitcoin, for example. There are a lot of complaints about, you know, proof of work being way too expensive in terms of energy, right? We've seen this with complaints about NFTs, whole narrative going around that NFTs are not green. But a lot of this can really change as Ethereum moves to proof of stake and consumes way less energy than it does right now while it's proof of work. So we'll see if this narrative actually takes off over time, but that's another that I can see that could be really strong for Ethereum compared to something like Bitcoin. All right, so those are some of the really strong narratives that can help, you know, generate a lot of momentum for Ethereum. But don't forget, the mo- the narratives, you can't run on narratives alone forever, okay? You actually have to have fundamentals as well. So let's talk about those. So if the Ethereum as a store of value narrative is really going to work, you know, we've seen a lot of institutions buying Bitcoin this time around, but we're already starting to see, you know, institutional interest in ETH as sort of the next logical step. It's having its status elevated from this, you know, kind of penny stock investment to more of a serious institutional grade asset. So examples of this are like ETH getting listed on the CME, so Chicago Mercantile Exchange. You know, we saw Ethereum futures launch early this year. We saw Grayscale reopening its Ethereum trust to investors and also endorsements like this from NetGalaxy Digital talking about ETH uh, being a growth asset and launching their suite of Ethereum funds. So this is all positive momentum for ETH, you know, continuing in that direction of being an institutional grade asset. And this will likely continue. So another strong fundamental component of ETH is actually its economics to support some of these narratives. So I talked about these some in the video already, but I want to re-mention them in this section. You know, ETH potentially becoming a deflationary asset down the road if there's enough sustained network activity post EIP 1559 and the hard fork happening in July. ETH becoming more scarce because a lot of it's getting locked up in staking, which is happening right now because, you know, ETH 2 phase zero is going around where people can actually send their ETH to that beacon chain and lock it up for staking today. And then also, you know, ETH going into DeFi, getting locked up that way so that it can earn, you know, interest. So basically ETH is a very productive asset with a lot of incentives not to sell because it can work for you while you're holding it, thus making it more scarce and thus really helping uh, decrease the sell pressure as the price goes up. So again, it's got a lot of strong fundamentals with the tech, with all the developments happening towards Ethereum 2.0. We've got 
got scaling coming really soon. Layer two is shipping, you know, inside this month that I'm recording this video. And I expect that we'll see wide adoption of layer two scaling solutions very soon after that. And going back to my original prediction that I made in January of this year, which is I think we'll see wide layer two adoption inside of 2021. And I think we're definitely on track to hit that. So another strong bit of fundamentals that ETH has going for it is the at number of active addresses is still steadily increasing. Sure, that's a strong fundamental because it shows people are actually using the network, but it's also incredibly bullish if you think that Metcalf's law is true and that that can be extrapolated to cryptocurrency prices. So I talked about this on my channel, but just to reiterate, Metcalf's law says that the value of a telecommunications network is proportional to the square of the number of connected users to the system. So basically like, you know, if there's two phones, there's one connection, if there's five, there's 25, et cetera, et cetera. So there's the famous uh, Raul Paul prediction that I've talked about on my channel before, where he applies this to, you know, to the price of cryptocurrency, saying there's an exponential correlation to the number of active addresses and the price of the asset itself. And so if that's true, and the number of active addresses is steadily increasing, then we very well could see this price correlate in that direction as well. And the last bit of fundamentals is the price, you know, action for ETH compared to Bitcoin relative to their histories. So, you know, ETH is about five years older than Bitcoin. And so it's really one market cycle behind Bitcoin, assuming that, you know, again, we're still in a market cycle that will boom and bust like the last one. And if you zoom out, their trajectories look very similar, especially if you're talking about like Bitcoin, once it reached like the $1,700 to $2,000 mark, I realize the market cap's a little bit different here, but a very similar type of thing is happening with ETH once it reached about the same level. And so if their histories look really similar, then, then ETH very well could, you know, continue on with a very similar trajectory that Bitcoin did in the last market cycle, which topped out at, you know, $20,000 about, which, you know, clearly exceeded 10K. But if you zoomed out and, you know, try to project that here, it would have looked, you know, kind of crazy. So again, we don't know for sure if that's going to happen. But another thing to think about is that these really, really big blow off tops tend to come at the end of these cycles. And if that happens again, then we could see history kind of repeat itself with ETH. All right, so that's an overview of the fundamentals that could be very positive for ETH. So let's glue all this together. We've talked about a lot of different things to see whether or not ETH could actually reach $10,000 this market cycle. Let's go back over our assumptions. You know, assuming that we are in a market cycle, that will, it will behave somewhat like the last market cycle, that it'll be a boom and bust cycle with a blow off top with a parabolic rise, right? Assuming that the cycle will continue, that we haven't you know, hit that top yet. Assuming that the narratives for ETH are favorable, like I think they will be. And assuming that the fundamentals stay strong, that all the scaling solutions ship when we think they're going to, that the number of active addresses increases, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Then all of these things really could provide the momentum that ETH needs. Like all these things mixed together to push ETH over that $10,000 price point, despite you know, some of the sluggish price action that we've seen, you know, recently. And that being said, you know, as always, it's not financial advice. I'm not telling you to buy or sell ETH based on this information. I just want to do, you know, a fundamental analysis on this and clearly show you my reasoning through this so that you can make up your mind yourself. Because again, any of these assumptions could be wrong and that could affect the outcome of, of what we think here. So let me know what you think down in the comment section below. So what do I personally think? Well, yes, I do think this could happen. Again, I like to be more conservative, more careful, not bank on this happening. As always, we could see statistical variance with this. You know, it might go above or below that by some amount. Again, if one of these assumptions is wrong, we may not even hit that amount. Something bad could happen, you know, in the global scene that could, you know, end the party early. You know, I don't have a crystal ball, but this is my analysis of what I think is possible based on the information I've shown you here today. All right. So that's all I've got. As always, you know, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so more people can learn about blockchain. If you like these videos and you're as fascinated with this technology as I am, then how can you get your hands dirty today? You go to my YouTube homepage. You can find any of my free courses there. I like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. If you like those, you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can show you to become a blockchain master step-by-step -step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. All right, you don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding background become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. All right, so that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.